And there's three different ways to check for heavy metals in the body. The first way is a blood test. And back in the day, that was the only test that was validated by the government for a diagnosis of heavy metal poisoning. The problem with a blood test is that your brain does everything it can to get that crud off the highway. When you have a heavy metal exposure, it'll be in your blood for about a couple of weeks. Uh, but then it's not in the blood anymore. Well, where'd it go? Well, if it didn't get filtered and eliminated from the body, it's deposited. Get it off the highway. So it's no longer on the highway. You know, your bloodstream's just a highway. Uh, you know, lots of traffic, lots of different vehicles there, but it's just a high, everything's going the same direction, but there's no lanes of traffic. You know, if you think about that, it's like bumper cars in the bloodstream all the time. You were a kid, drive bumper cars at the circus, right? Yeah smash into each other. But that's what's happening in the bloodstream all the time. Dr. Tom O'Brien, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. I uh, have been a fan of your work for quite some time. I'm an FDNer, so Reed Davis and Functional Diagnostic Nutrition is actually where I originally learned from you. And Sean Croxton, here's a fun fact for you. Sean Croxton, who I know you know, uh, is actually the person who helped me create my company, Keto Camp, several years ago. I hired him as a marketing coach. So I'm very familiar with you through Sean Croxton and Reed Davis. And of course, Dr. Prompo brought you in for our platinum call. And I'm just so grateful to be with you today. And here's where I want to start, Tom. You grew up in Detroit, and that's a very toxic environment. You lived eight uh, blocks away, or just a few blocks away, one block away from the Ford assembly line, driving your bike through there. And not knowing, you know, that you're doing anything bad, breathing in all these chemicals. And then as an adult, you were a triathlon and you ended up having some health issues. So could you take us back there and what happened with your health issues and what was the cause of those uh, health issues? Uh, well, the, the health issue that I noticed more than any other was blood sugar instability. And, uh, uh, and at the time we were talking about hypoglycemia, low blood sugar and, and, uh, the list of manifestations that can occur from that. And everyone, not, not really, but most people had some of those symptoms. And so it was a very common theme to be talking about. It's not so much now. Now we talk more about insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So we've taken it a step deeper in our understanding of the science and where all this stuff comes from. But my main thing was um, low blood sugar. Uh, uh, as I opened my practice and, and uh, continued doing triathlons. And at some point there was some, uh, I don't want to say cognitive issues, but why, why is my brain not where oh, I'm just tired. I've been, you know, I put in a 60 hour week, blah, 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 whatever. And I tried to justify and I, and it, that just didn't work. And uh, then I had chest pains which uh, were substantial and his family history of cardiovascular disease. And, and so I went and got all of the tests. I scored the highest of anyone in the cardiac center on stress EKG, you know, walking tall, my heart's good, my cardiovascular system's good. And uh, I just didn't get, and, and then by the time I was, I think it was 42, um, I started having vision problems. You know, I wasn't focusing I couldn't see, this, this is where it occurred, ja Jacksonville, Florida, arrived at the airport uh, to do a talk, and I'm looking at, the, there's a row of baggage claims, baggage claim one, two, three, four, five, and what uh, city uh, the, those bags, uh, the flight that arrived were being, their bags were being put on that carousel. And I couldn't see past uh, baggage claim two, you know, I'm standing at one and I see two and I see three and I can't read it. And what, what? And I'm like squinting and I walk over oh, then, then I can read it. And I see, uh, I'm 42. This isn't supposed to be happening at 42. So I went to an ophthalmologist and well, first to an optometrist. And uh, he said, well, yeah, you probably would benefit from some reading glasses, but there's, you're really okay. Then I went to a behavioral optometrist a little more advanced guy in uh, triggers that cause vision disturbances. And he said something similar. And reading glasses would probably be helpful. Then I went to an ophthalmologist and that didn't do it. 
And then I went for my annual checkup with my internist uh, because of the cardiovascular scare. I just decided, you know, I'm going to get a checkup every year just to be sure. And I told him about all of this and the baggage claim thing a few months earlier. And he just looked at me and says, well, Tom, you've got a cataract. And he, I said, what? And I mean, he just saw it with a simple little um, uh, scope looking in my eye. And I'd been to two optometrists and an ophthalmologist. They didn't see the cataract. <laughs> so, I, so I go back the ophthalmologist and I'm not a happy guy, you know, saying, how did you miss a cataract? You know, you've got a great reputation and we're friends, but how in the hell did you miss a cataract? Said, oh, you're right. You've got a cataract. Well, you know, the equipment we use goes deep into the eye, right? Blah, blah, blah. I said, but I'm sorry. I said, okay, fine. Let's get, take this thing out. So they took it out and an asymmetrical cataract in a 42 year old guy is unusual. The other eye was perfect. The lens in the other eye was perfect. It's unusual. And I said, well, what do you think? What's the Hell, some people just get this. And I just said, <laughs> well, no, that doesn't do it. <laughs> that yeah. doesn't do it. And so I started looking at the literature and I found that lead poisoning could be a trigger. And I said, oh, I don't have any lead poisoning. And you were doing right. tests. You, you were doing lead uh, testing on your patients, right, at that time? Oh, gosh, I had done, by the time I was 42, I'd probably done 200, 300 tests. Wow. And there's three different ways to check for heavy metals in the body. The first way is a blood test. And back in the day, that was the only test that was validated by the government for a diagnosis of heavy metal poisoning. What's the problem and with that test? The problem with a blood test is that your brain does everything it can to get that crud off the highway. And so uh, when you have a heavy metal exposure, it'll be in your blood for about a couple of weeks. Uh, but then it's not in the blood anymore. Well, where'd it go? Well, if it didn't get filtered and eliminated from the body, it's deposited. Get it off the highway. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer on the highway. You know, your bloodstream is just a highway. Uh, you know, lots of traffic, lots of different vehicles there, but it's just a high. Everything's going the same direction, but there's no lanes of traffic. You know, if you think about that, it's like bumper cars in the bloodstream all the time. You're a kid, drive bumper cars at the circus, right? Yeah smash into each other but that's what's happening in the bloodstream all the time so that but, the argument so when they make the argument tom that silver amalgam fillings are totally safe because they do measurements on the blood right after they put them in that's the reason why it's it's going somewhere else it's going into your tissues it's going into your bone it's going somewhere else that's exactly right because silver amalgam fillings are usually 48 to 50 percent mercury yeah and that's the problem it's not the silver but it's what's um, the heavy metal in there and a blood test will not tell you that unless you just got the fillings in the last two weeks. Then most likely you may see a slight spike uh, that would go up, but then it goes down right away. And so they, oh, don't worry about it. There's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So that's a blood test. The second way is a hair analysis. And if it's a good lab, you know, back in the 80s, I, I opened my practice on Valentine's Day in 1980. Wow. And, uh, I wasn't even born then. I know. I, I know. That ages me a bit, you know. <laughs> but back in the 80s, the concept of hair analysis and interpreting hair analysis for more than just components in the hair had a, had a, a, um, a lot of mileage. Uh, there was a lot of people in complementary holistic conferences, a lot of vendors. Um, There's always two, three, four vendors that hair analysis labs, and you interpret the ratios of different minerals to suggest hypoadrenia or kidney dysfunction, or using the, the components of the hair for more than just what's in the hair. Uh, uh, and there's still great value in that. Uh, the, the science has been dialed down a lot more. For minerals. But for, for minerals. Yeah. Uh, but identifying heavy metals in hair, there's no question. If it's in your bloodstream, it gets deposited in the new hair that's growing out. The minerals and metals in your bloodstream will be in your hair. But the laboratory sensitivity for that testing, the equipment can only use hair that is um, uh, less than two months old. So that's one inch of hair from the nape of the neck. You know, you might grow an inch of hair in a couple of months, and that's being really generous. Uh, but all the laboratories, said, you know, if you've got long hair, 
cut and throw it away. Just give us the inch closest to the nape of the neck uh, or pubic hair. Uh, it's the same thing, uh, but no more than an inch in length. Well, that inch of growth is thought to be about two months worth of growth. So when you're measuring heavy metals in hair and hair analysis, one inch of hair, if it's a good lab, it's going to be really accurate as to what's been in your bloodstream in the last two months. But that has no bearing at all on what's accumulated in your body. Mm -hmm. it, it, by definition, it can't. it can't. So using hair analysis to determine heavy metal concentrations in the body is has no credibility whatsoever. Agreed. Um, it's, it, it's great for a number of reasons, uh, but not to identify accumulation of heavy metals. The third method is to take a chelating agent, meaning like a magnet that pulls heavy metals out of storage, out of the bones, out of the brain tissue, out of the fat cells. It pulls it out of storage, so now it's in the bloodstream. And then you collect the urine over 24 hours. And I have always done, and there's debate about this. Some docs will say, use the chelating agents for four hours or six hours. I do it for three days. Yeah, us uh, too, be yeah. Uh, because we want to know, hey, I want to know what's in there. Well, so the people can get sick. Well, that's true. So you don't do a heavy metal test until you've opened up detox pathways. So if there is a temporary increase in metals getting into the bloodstream, your detox pathways are working really good, which means that you're drinking at least a half ounce of water every day, a half ounce per pound body weight every day. And well, I'll be peeing all day. Well, that's the idea, right? Right. You know, and, and you make sure your bowel movements are great. And if you're not taking enough fiber, you, you, you make sure you're taking enough fiber. So patients need to prepare for at least a week or two before they do a provocative urine heavy metal test. They just have to make sure. And then we do it for three days. And you, you can use, there's a, a few different agents, DMSA, EDTA. Uh, there's a few different agents that you can use. Um, and whether you do it for four hours or one day or three days, the concept's the same. You pull that stuff out of storage. Now it's in circulation and you collect the urine and you check the urine. And now you're talking turkey. And what we um, have operated from for 40 years was that a three-day provocative challenge, what you pull out is about one-tenth of what is in your body. And then the treatment protocol is three days of the chelating agents every two weeks. So Mrs. Patient, on your calendar, you have a wall calendar? Yes, okay, when you go home, circle Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, next week. Then go down two weeks, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Then go down two weeks, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And do that for 10 different circles, so that's 20 weeks. And then two weeks after the last circle, you write retest. And so you do three days of chelation every two weeks, making sure that you have lots of uh, fiber, lots of uh, you're well, well hydrated, uh, and you're taking minerals to, to pull this stuff out and to replenish minerals into the tissue. Um, because it would take about 10 sessions of that before we get negative tests back. And you, you have to retest. Well, I've got heavy metals. Oh, my God. The doctor said that's some of the highest he's ever seen. Wow. Well, okay. What happened? Well, I did the protocol. Oh, good, good. And did you retest? Uh, no. Why not? Well, I don't know. I feel better. But you have no idea if there's still lead in your bones. So I, when I did that on myself, I had the highest level of lead of anyone I've ever tested. And I'd done a few hundred tests at that time. Wow. By that time. Did you think and it was wrong? And, and it's, no, God, no, I said, and when I saw that, my jaw dropped and I just, oh, wow. And I still remember, I still remember, you know, riding around the block on my bicycle, can't cross the street. So I ride all the way around and then on the street behind us. And that's the street on the river where the Rouge uh, Ford plant was on the other side of the river. 
So I'm riding along the sidewalk and going around the block, coming back by my house, riding around. And when we would have our Kool-Aid stand, Kool-Aid, Kool-Aid, two cents a glass, if you don't like it. And when we get past one neighbor's house who we didn't really like at all, we just shout out, kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I was like six years old. You That's know, fun. <laughs> what are you going to do, you know? But, but I remembered riding my bicycle around all the time. And I just love to ride my bicycle. And we lived there from my birth until I was eight. And uh, so in that eight years of living across the river and one block in from the Rouge River Ford assembly line, the largest assembly line in the world at that time. Wow. uh, With no government regulations for uh, heavy metal uh, filtration on their smokestacks. We were just sucking in a lot of lead and it stayed in my body for 40 years and it manifested as a cataract. Uh, so that's the heavy and I you know, I'll still do triathlons and I was scoring well and doing all that. My blood sugar was stable. I was taking a ton of nutrients, you know, at that yeah. time for that. Uh, so I felt pretty good. But this little bit of cognitive, well, what's going on today? How come I'm uh, I don't know. It's just too. I'm working too hard. And, but no, it was lead poisoning in my brain. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a great share because we're going to get into these five pillars that Harvard uh, Medical School is talking about when it comes to chronic inflammation, chronic disease. And I know number two is the environment. And before we get into those, and I want you to kind of explain what, what I'm talking about here, I too was um, heavy metal poison. I had eight silver amalgam fillings in my mouth put in when I was a kid. I had him for over 20 years. And it wasn't until I met Dr. Pompa that he's like, got to get it out. And then on top of that, Tom, the house I was living in several years ago had black mold that was hidden oh and they discovered, right? So my body oh my. was beat up. And eventually, of course, I got out of that, that space and I got the fillings out safely. I've done the detox that I learned from Dr. Pompa and my health just has transformed ever since. So we're painting the Marvelous. picture on the environment. So let's talk about Harvard Medical School and why they're talking about this and how cool it is that they're talking about these five pillars that contribute to disease in the gut, which is leaky gut. Go ahead. Well, um, uh, my friend and mentor, Professor Alessio Fasano, he's the chair of pediatric gastroenterology, Mass General at Harvard, professor of medicine, Harvard Medical School, Professor of Nutrition, Harvard School of Public Health, the director of the Mucosal Immunology Center at Harvard, and the director of the Celiac Research Center at Harvard. This guy's got five titles. Any one title is a lifelong dream for people at the top of their field. So true. He's got five. He's got five. (laughs) It's impressive. We think he'll win the Nobel Prize because he and his team discovered this protein, zonulin, in 1997, they wrote their, I think it was their first paper, uh, that that is the mechanism by which the cells of, of the inner lining of the gut open up, intestinal permeability, is a zonulin modulated mechanism. And when you have too much zonulin being secreted, your cells are open too much, too frequently, too, too large, you get, that's leaky gut. So he, is, he and his team identified leaky gut way back then. And for the last 20 years, they have been uh, writing about it and demonstrating the uh, 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 mechanism, uh, the complications of what that causes. Many, many, many papers. And he published a paper uh, in January of 2019, I think, yeah, 2019. And, you know, this guy is so careful about everything he says. He has to be really, really careful because, you know, the whole world wants to use him as a reference and they'll misquote him, right? So he's really careful. But listen to the title of this paper that he wrote in January 2019. All disease begins in the, quote, leaky gut, the role of zonulin, in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases, intestinal permeability and chronic inflammatory diseases. All disease begins in the leaky gut. And this is what they're teaching at Harvard now. 
And, and so Fasano, in that paper, he identified the five mechanisms that create what he refers to as the perfect storm in developing chronic inflammatory diseases. Every disease is a chronic inflammatory disease. Not quite. I mean, there's a sodium deficiency that will cause shrinkage of a part of your brain without inflammation. Uh, if you don't get some salt, you have to have some sodium in your diet, just not too much, but you have to have some. But and that's, and that's I, really rare. I mean, that's. Yeah, rare. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, as far as I, in my everyday practice, everything I see is a chronic inflammatory disease. Well, we now know the mechanism by which chronic inflammatory diseases occur. And this is what they're teaching at Harvard. This perfect storm has what I call five pillars. Those five pillars that Professor Fasano has identified. First, it's your genetics. Now, you can't do anything about your genes. That's the deck of cards you've been dealt. And some doctors say, well, we're going to turn off those genes. And you can't turn off genes. There's no evidence you ever turn off genes. Genes operate on a dimmer switch, but and you can dim them down or you can turn them up really bright, but you can't turn them off, right? Uh, and what controls the dimmer switch of your genes? It doesn't matter that you, that you have the Alzheimer's gene. It doesn't mean you're getting Alzheimer's mm -hmm. or if you have the BRCA gene. It doesn't mean you're getting breast cancer, but it means if that gene gets turned up really bright, you're more than likely, that's where you're going to manifest a chronic inflammatory disease is in those genes. So what you want to do is dim down those genes, right? That's, that's the secret elixir uh, for long-term vitality and well-being is dim down the genes of inflammation. It's that simple. We just don't like it because every time you eat a French fry, those saturated transformed fatty acid fats from the high temperature bubbling potatoes in that stuff, smoking oil from French fries, those fats are in your bloodstreams for up to 57 days, causing, anti, uh, causing oxidation, oxidative stress, more free radicals, more free radicals, more free radicals, 57 days. You tell that to an athlete and their jaw drops. And, mm -hmm. and I say, you know, you want to perform well. You always need more oxygen in your bloodstream, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you eat bad fats, you decrease the oxygen available in your bloodstream for up to 57 days after you eat that. I mean, this whole concept from doctors, excuse me, but I'll go toe to toe with anybody about this concept of a cheat day. Mm -hmm. Well, it's okay to have a cheat day. No, it's not. It's not. Now, we're human. But we're not consciously going to say, I'm going to throw out everything I know I'm supposed to do one day a week because I'm going to, this is my cheat day. Yeah. I deserve a cheat day because I'm good the other days. Or everything You're, in moderation, right? Right, right. Nonsense. That's because doctors want to be their patients' friends. They want to be, they want their message accepted. You've got to be the wall. And I'll give you an example. You know, when I recommend a test to somebody, it's not because I'm doing a shotgun, let's test everything in the world to see you know, what sticks on the wall, where we're going to put our attention. I recommend a test because the clinical evidence and the history of the patient suggests this is an area that we really have to, it's at the top of the checklist. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? This is at the top, Mrs. Patient. We have to check this. If they refuse to do the test, because well, I don't want to do a blood test or, or you know, how much does insurance, well, insurance doesn't pay for it. I'm not going to do it. I say, oh, OK. And then I always did this. Patient refuses to do this test because insurance won't pay for it. Here, please sign this. Why? Well, because you're asking me to work with one hand behind my back and I'll do the best I can. But if you die, I'm not going to be responsible two years ago. And your patients say I didn't do my job. You're going to sign this or I'm referring you to another doctor. Oh, OK, OK, I'll do the test. Great. All right. Let's get it done. And then you see, you know, I feel really bad if a test comes back negative the first time. None of my tests come back negative the first time because you use your common sense and functional medicine training 
to determine where are we likely to find the major culprits right now. And later, Mrs. Patient, there may be some, like peeling away the layers of an onion. There may be more things underneath, but for right now, this is at the top of the checklist. We got to look for this and this and this. So that's genetics. Can't do anything about genetics. Number two is environmental triggers. And environmental triggers are the fingers on the dimmer switch that turn your genes up or down. That's the way you think about genes. It's like the round dimmer switch not, or, or the slide up and down, whichever you want, you know, but it's dimming down or ramping up that gene to express itself. And where are the fingertips coming from that have their hands on the control of that dimmer switch? It's what you're exposed to in your environment. And as you said, you lived in a house with black mold, so you're inhaling this all the time. Well, we know that 60 to 65 percent of all Alzheimer's is inhalation Alzheimer's. It's what you're breathing that goes straight up into the memory center of the brain. Those are the only nerves in the body that have no screen from the body before they get to the brain. There's no screening. There's no filters. There's nothing. The olfactory nerves go straight back into the uh, hypothalamus, right back into the memory center. Why? Why? I'm sorry, the hippocampus, not the hypothalamus. Into the hippocampus. Why? Because our ancestors, our ancestors, they're walking down the trail. They better be able to smell saber-toothed tiger and get out of there really quick. It's a life-saving mechanism. Or when they find food, what are the, what are they, the very first thing they do, they grab something, what do they do? They sniff it. Mm. You, they have to be able to tell, is this bad bacteria? Is this poisonous to me? And then they nibble on it for taste, and then they eat it, right? So our olfactory nerves are the only nerves in the body that escort molecules straight back to the memory center of the brain. That's why the smell test is so critically important on our website. It's the first indicator that the memory center of your brain is on fire. So when you do this simple smell test and, you know, it's um, you, you, you take a coin, you scratch it and you smell it. And there's four options. Is it, does it smell like rubber, strawberry, whiskey or cinnamon? And you mark your answer. Turn the page, scratch the next one and you smell it, and there's four more, and there's 12 of these. Last page, there's the answer sheet. And so you score. If you score nine or below, you've got hyposmia. You're losing your sense of smell. And you go to my website, thedr.com forward slash smell, and just, I've done videos on this, so, you, so you, you can understand this. It's the cheapest test to tell you is the memory center of your brain on fire right now. Fascinating. And if it comes back positive, then you do the blood test called the Neural Zoomer Plus to identify how bad is the fire, right? But you'll never check unless you know. That's why the smell test is so critically important. But that's inhalation as part of the environment. That's what you had in your, in your house with the mm -hmm. black mold. But the most common environmental trigger with their fingertips on the dimmer switches of your body is what's on the end of your fork. Mm. Everything you put, there are no neutrals, absolutely no neutrals of what you put in your mouth, except healthy water. That's the only neutral. Everything else is going to activate genes of inflammation or genes of anti-inflammation. Everything else is going to feed the bacteria in your gut for inflammation or feed the bad guys, the bacteria of your gut for anti, for inflammation or the other for anti-inflammation. Uh, anti Sorry, mm -hmm. I got that one. So that's, a, that's great to, to kind of be aware of because when you're making a decision of what to eat, you could ask yourself, is this going to feed inflammation or this is going to feed anti-inflammation? Exactly, exactly. You know, when I'm walking through an airport, you know, I usually put 150,000 miles on a year uh, teaching around the world, but not this last two years. Uh, but when I'm in an airport, um, it's really a judgment call. What's going to be less inflammatory? And I love it when I change planes in Houston because there's a restaurant there called Papadou. And Papadou is a seafood place. And I can get a clean piece of fish 
and uh, some uh, green beans and some baby potatoes uh, in butter and garlic. Okay, now they're not organic, you know, but um, it's the best that I can do and I've got to eat. You know, and I, I stack my backpack with bars and things, but when you got to eat, you have to be thinking, is this going to cause more inflammation? And if it is, and then you say, but there's nothing else available. Okay, wh what do I have in my backpack? Oh, I've, I've got a bar. Great, I'll, I'll just do a bar. And so you, that's the way you have to think all the time as you get more educated on what's inflammatory and what's not inflammatory. So that's number two, environmental triggers. Number three is the impact of the environmental triggers on the microbiome in your gut. And that's, uh, that's to be clear, it starts in your mouth and it goes to the other end. That's your microbiome. The oral mucosa is critically important all the way down to the other end. All critically important. We think about the large intestine. That's where the majority of the bacteria is, but it's critically important from one end to the other. So when you have environmental triggers causing inflammation, you alter the balance of the good guys and the bad guys in your microbiome creating a condition called dysbiosis, which means too many bad guys, not enough good guys, and now you've got an inflammatory state in your gut. And when you have the inflammatory state in your gut, that creates step number four, the leaky gut. And when you have the leaky gut, those cells are separating, these molecules get in, but well, let's do that. Mrs. Patient, your digestive tract starts at the mouth, goes to the other end. The lining of it is like cheesecloth. Cheesecloth for, uh, from the other side of the stomach down to the end, it's lined with cheesecloth. It's called the epithelial lining. R only really small molecules can get through the cheesecloth. So think of protein like a pearl necklace. This is Professor Pisano's analogy. The acid in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. And your digestive enzymes and your micro, uh, some of the enzymes are produced by the good guys in your gut. The enzymes act as scissors to cut that pearl necklace. Cut it, cut it, snip, 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 snip. Until you're down to each pearl of the pearl necklace. And that's called an amino acid. And those pearls go right through the cheesecloth into the mud, uh, bloodstream. And then they're, they're off. And they're the building blocks. You have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell in your body regenerates. How, how do you build new cells? The building blocks in the bloodstream are called amino acids. So the absorption of the amino acids occurs after the digestion. The enzymes have cut the proteins smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Great analogy. When, when you get tears in the cheesecloth, because you've got too much of the wrong kind of bacteria in your gut because you have too many environmental triggers over the years creating too many of the wrong bacteria in your gut, and that inflammation tears the cheesecloth, now larger clumps of the pearl necklace get through into the bloodstream before they've been snipped down enough to fit through the cheesecloth. Those larger molecules are called macromolecules, big molecules. They get through into the bloodstream, and now they're off and running on the highway. And your immune system says, what the heck is this? This is not a building block I can use. I better fight this thing. Yo, general. And in your immune system, you've got Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. We call them IGA, IgG, IgM, IgE. And you now are general chicken. Get rid of that macromolecule of chicken. Now you make antibodies to chicken or you make antibodies to gluten, or you make antibodies to dairy, you make antibodies to tomatoes. It doesn't matter what the macromolecule is. When it gets through the tears in the cheesecloth, pathogenic intestinal permeability, when it gets through the tears in the cheesecloth, your immune system trying to protect you is going to fight this thing. So you make the antibodies. That's why someone does a 90 food panel and it comes back, oh my God, 25 foods, that's everything I eat. Well, of course it is. Your immune system's just trying to protect you, right? Get, stop eating those foods for six months, clean up your gut, then go back and check again. Now you're sensitive to two foods, maybe three. And those are the ones you stay away from forever, mm -hmm. right? 
So now you've got these antibodies in the bloodstream looking for chicken, looking for tomatoes, looking for bananas, looking for yeast, looking for bacteria, all these different macromolecules to get through into the bloodstream. Now you have all these antibodies in the bloodstream. The problem is, and what's the, the problem with this, one of the problems with this vaccine that we're talking about now, nowadays, is that these antibodies looking for chicken, looking for tomatoes, looking for spike proteins, they're looking for, how do they know what molecules to attack? They've been programmed by general chicken to look for the amino acid sequence of chicken. And I'm gonna say it's A, A, B, C, D. So the antibodies are looking for A, A, B, C, D. I call it orange vests. So the antibodies are looking for orange vests of chicken and the red vests of tomatoes and the blue vests of, of yeast. Or, you know, they're, they're just looking for these amino acid sequences that we can understand it. Oh, look, there's an orange vest, a guy with an orange vest over there. So that's what they're looking for. And they fight it. They destroy it. They fire their, their chemical bullets called cytokines to destroy that. The problem is the amino acid signature of chicken looks a whole lot like a small part of the amino acid structure of the saran wrap around your nerves called myelin. So the antibodies looking for yellow vests or orange vests, look over there, orange vests, but it's actually myelin, but it's, it's the orange, it's the amino acid sequence, and they fire their chemical bullets at myelin. When they fire the chemical bullets at myelin, they damage the myelin tissue. Now your immune system has to make more antibodies to myelin to get rid of this damaged myelin tissue. Not a problem, except you keep eating chicken a couple times a week or you keep eating gluten every day and you make the antibodies to the gluten and the gluten antibodies, have, it's called molecular mimicry, that the, the, the uh, yellow vests of gluten look a whole lot like your cerebellum in your brain, the myelin in your brain, the gangliosides in your brain the collagen on your joints. That's why gluten can cause so many different problems is the amino acid signature of gluten looks a whole lot like many of our own tissues, that the proteins of our own tissues are hundreds of amino acids long, but this little sequence is the same sequence as in gluten. And so the result is the antibodies created by the immune system trying to protect you from the macromolecule of chicken or gluten or dairy or whatever it is, now they're going after myelin, if that's your genetic vulnerability. And now when that happens, now, you, so that's number five, systemic inflammation in the body. And it's that systemic inflammation that is the mechanism of every chronic disease. Yeah, what a, what a great explanation. Um re-listen to that for those who are listening, listen to it again. Or if you're watching on YouTube, watch that again. I have a question about the fourth step, the leaky gut part, right? Yeah. Uh, I learned this from you that you have 10 times more bacteria in the gut than all of the, the cells in the human body. And oh my God. You know, you know, no, let's just stay with that for a minute. Okay. The, you know, numbers don't mean anything to people. They don't. But my, my primary mentor and my friend, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, the founder of Functional Medicine. The guy is unbelievable. If you ever get a chance to hear him speak, just Google him and listen to anything he's talking about. And you'll say, oh, that makes sense. And he's so smart. He's got a photographic memory. I interviewed Jeff last year. And cool. he said, he said, Tom, a teaspoon of poop, a teaspoon has more bacteria in it than all the, all the stars in the known universe. And Jeffrey does not exaggerate. Hmm. And I'm like, what? 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 Yeah, you try to wrap your head around that. Yeah. And when you do, you understand that every forkful of what you put in your mouth is going to feed good bacteria or bad bacteria. But it's going to take months and months and months to change the environment of your microbiome. You start getting benefits the more aggressive you are pretty quickly, but to turn this thing around, to really turn it around is going to take quite a while to do. 
That's why you can't say, well, I've had a good diet now for three weeks, but my gut's still not quite working right. You know, you, you, you can't think like that. It's just not going to work, right? It's going to take months to do this. But when you understand every time you eat a teaspoon of blueberries, this is why one cup of blueberries a day, one cup of blueberries a day for three years and your brain's working as well as it was 13 years earlier at one cup of, with everything else the same in your life. You know, that's why it took three years, mm -hmm. but then they were able to measure it because of the, the polyphenols, the benefits in blueberries, right? So I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you, but I wanted people to like wrap your head around that. A teaspoon of poop, more bacteria than all the stars in the known universe. So that's if incredible. you think, if you think taking a capsule a day of some, probiotics is going to fix your gut, you're in for a hard awakening a few years from now when your disease or some new disease occurs because you didn't quite comprehensively deal with it. So true. If only it was that easy, just taking probiotics to fix your gut. Uh, it's, right. not, it's not that easy. <laughs> right. Uh, and then I also have in my notes here, most, most bacteria in your gut have 100 to 150 more genes than the entire human genome. That's right. That's right. You know, so <laughs> it's a great discussion when we're um, uh, uh, done teaching uh, and, you know, we go to dinner with my friends at, you know, some conference, wherever we are. And usually by the second bottle of wine, we're, we're talking about this, uh, about are we really humans with a whole lot of bacteria or are we bacteria having a human experience? Because genes determine function. Every scientist knows that. For every part of our lives, the genes that get activated make the proteins, stimulate the production of the proteins that determine action. Action at the cellular level, action at the tissue level, action at the brain level with our thoughts. Our genes determine all of that. And if there's a hundred times more genes than uh, of bacteria that are circulating through our body, all of the messages from those genes circulating in our body compared to the number of human genes, who's running the ship? Sounds like the bacteria I mean, are. It's, it's a great discussion to have. You know, if you're geeky, you know, it's kind of fun to, hey, you know, I just read this study last week. Did, did you know that? that, that? I, I didn't know that. Send me that study. Well, that kind of goes along with, bah, 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 you know, and you just kind of bounce off each other. It's really fun. It's really yeah. fun to do that. It's <laughs> awesome. I love it. I can see how much it lights you up. Uh, and then 30% of all the molecules in your bloodstream are the metabolites from the gut. 36%. 36%. 36% of all of the small molecules on your blood are the messengers from the bacteria in the gut. I it's call crazy. it the exhaust, the exhaust of the gut. They're, they're metabolites. But the bacteria in your gut, bacteria produces exhaust. That exhaust is called the metabolites. Those metabolites get into your bloodstream, and at any time, 36% of all the small molecules in your bloodstream are the metabolites of the microbiome. So who's running the ship? That's why, you know, it was Michael Gershon from Princeton in 1999. He wrote the book, the second brain. Mm -hmm. And it was about the gut. And he really guided us back then before we knew every, uh, everything that we know today, which is still nothing or very close to nothing uh, compared to where we're going to be. But he told us back then for every one message from the brain going down, telling the gut what to do. There are nine messages from the gut going up, telling the brain what to do. The ratio is nine to one. And this is how it occurs. The metabolites of the bacteria in your gut and the more of the bacteria you have the more the, the stronger the message so if you've got a large colony of klebsiella pneumonia the number one bacteria for that people get in hospitals and they get pneumonia from it if you and i've had hundreds of people on stool tests on poop tests that have high concentrations of klebsiella and if you've got a high concentration of klebsiella the message going through the bloodstream up to your brain is not a don't worry, be happy kind of message. 
it's like anxiety or depression or bipolar. It sets up the mechanisms for cognitive dysfunction. That's why whenever you have brain dysfunction, and that's the whole message behind my book, You Can Fix Your Brain, whenever you have brain dysfunction of any type, you always have to include fixing the gut. All disease begins in the gut. We started the show with that, and that's where we're going to end the show. Yeah. All disease begins in the gut. That's what they're teaching at Harvard Medical School. And I'm giving you the watered-down version of that, you know, so that we, we can understand it. It's like an OMG again mm -hmm. and again. Uh, really, one teaspoon, all the stars in the known universe, really one cup of blueberries a day. And, and there's one last point that I'd like to make, if mm -hmm. I can. Yep. And this really startled me, and I was embarrassed. I didn't know about this. The paper was published in 2019, and I, didn't, I missed it. It's in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So it's a prestigious journal, valid paper. As a matter of fact, the editors actually wrote a comment about this paper, and they said, this is an elegant study using sophisticated measurements, and da da da, da. But the editors don't give their stamp of approval to articles in the journal very often, but they did. And so I, you know, I read that study and it just dropped my jaw. They looked at young women who wanted to get pregnant. And so this was just women, but they, they looked at a number of young women who wanted to get pregnant. And the marker that they wanted to follow to see what kind of results they got was first, did they eat fruits and vegetables and how much? And then were they organic or conventional? Conventional means you buy them in a supermarket. They're regular. They're not organic. And they followed these people. And what they found out, and this is the elegant study stamped by the editors of the Journal of the American Medical Association. What they found out was that if you ate more than 2.3 servings per day of conventional vegetables, compared to 2.3 or more servings per day of organic vegetables, those that ate more than 2.3 servings of conventional vegetables had an 18% less likelihood of getting pregnant. 18%. Wow. But here's the kicker. They had a 26%, if they got pregnant, eating conventional vegetables more than 2.3 servings per day, they had a 26% less likelihood of having a live birth. They had wow. miscarriages or stillbirths. What? What? I mean, that's jaw dropping. Those are huge percentages. Huge. And this is not a community college paper. Mm -hmm. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association stamped by the editors and categorized as an elegant study. Meaning, wake up, world. And I, I realize that I've been thinking the way I've been thinking for the last 10 years. Yeah, I'll get organic, you know, whenever it's available. But if not, you know, fruits and vegetables are good for you. Well, I've had to change that thinking. Yeah. You can't eat conventional vegetables and fruits because the poisons, the insecticides and the pesticides and the altered proteins and the GMO foods that we now have so commonly available to us are having an effect on our function in our body. Yeah. So if you cannot afford or don't have access to convent to organic vegetables and fruits, then you go to ewg.org, the environmental working group.org, nonprofit. I, I hope everyone will support them. They're doing God's work on mm -hmm. the planet. You want to know about what sunscreens are safe to use and which ones are full of chemicals that give your yeah. kids cancer? Yeah. Just go to ewg. Toothpaste, makeup, it. yeah, that's great. Makeup, any of that stuff. So please, everyone, support that group. Mm -hmm. Just send them 25 bucks, right? Or 100 bucks, whatever is generous for you because they're, they're, they're doing God's work. But you, you go there and you download their list of the dirty dozen. You never eat the dirty dozen. These are the conventional fruits and vegetables that have the highest concentrations of insecticides and pesticides. And rather than that, you download also their Clean 15. These are their conventional fruits and vegetables that have the least amount 
of insecticides and pesticides. So that's the first thing you do. And the next thing you do is you go to mygreenfills.com and you buy their fruit and veggie wash because it gets rid of over 90, I think it's 94% of the insecticides and pesticides on the fruits and vegetables. So if you can't get organic, you, you go to the clean 15, avoid the dirty dozen and get the veggie wash. And, and that way you're protecting yourself, minimizing the damage for you and your family. It's great advice. I use My Green Fills. I think they rebranded to a new company, but you could still find them by searching My, my Green Fills. Yeah. Um, that study is, is mind boggling. I know we're wrapping out, we're running out of time here, but can it, can't they use that study to go to court and make a case against these glyphosate, herbicides, Roundup, et cetera? Like, are they doing that with this study? Do you know that? Who is they? Yeah. I mean, I know Jeffrey Smith is, I had him on the show. He's a big, he's, you know, somebody who's doing some cool things, but I don't know, John, uh, or, uh, yeah, John F. Kennedy Jr. Right. <laughs> well, he's trying, isn't he? Robert yeah. F. Kennedy, Jr. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Right. Excuse he's, me. Yeah. he's trying, he's trying. Yeah. And so he gets branded by those companies as a nutcase yeah. uh, that exaggerate. He, he, he doesn't exaggerate. No, he doesn't. He's, he's telling the truth. Yeah. He's telling the truth and it's just inconvenient for us. Yeah. We don't like to hear this kind of stuff. But couldn't they do something? The they is you. You need to do something. You do this for you and your family. And the result is this becomes part of your life, that you do organic at every step. You, uh, you, you get a bay window in your kitchen, and you grow your own herbs. You grow parsley, and you put a little fresh parsley on your food, you know, and you... You just start doing the little things that you can do. You get a garden. Now we've got these hydroponic gardens that can go in any room where you, you can grow for a family of four, all the lettuce and tomatoes and different vegetables uh, very inexpensively once you've set this up. It works for years when you use these kinds of things. So there's things that you can do, but they aren't going to protect you. Yeah, just, well said. just like with this whole vaccine thing, we've got they are not going to protect you. You yeah. need to be asking questions. Yeah, well said. Wait, great way to finish the conversation. They is you. They is me. They is us. It's it's our day to day choices. We vote with our, our dollars um, and we got to make the right decisions here. Your book, you have two great books out there. You can fix your brain and the autoimmune fix. We'll link both of those down below. Your website is the dr.com. If you want to do that smell test, the dr.com slash smell. Anywhere else they could go check you out, Dr. Tom? One of the things that we're uh, extremely proud of, we're proud of everything that's out there. My team has worked so hard over the years. They really have. Uh, my wife and I traveled to seven different countries, and uh, we interviewed 85 uh, different people, the world leaders in autoimmune diseases. And I knew the questions to ask them because I'd read their studies, <laughs> right? So I didn't say, so how did you get into autoimmunity? You know, I didn't waste time with any of that. Rather, it was, so Professor Schoenfeld, when you talk about adjuvants in vaccines, harming people, can you tell us more about that? And you hear about if you carry the gene, HLA-DRB1, you're at high risk of having a reaction to a vaccine. And so for your children, your infants, you check those genes so that if they carry HLA-DRB1, caution is advised in the administration of vaccines, which means if you choose to do vaccines, you give them one. You wait a few weeks, build up their immune system, then you give them one. And you wait a few weeks and you don't give them three, four, six vaccines all at once when their immature immune system can't handle that and, and create the inflammatory cascades that cause so many problems we're seeing from vaccines. This, yeah. has been, this debate's been going on for decades now. But when you hear the world's leaders talking about this, and then I interviewed the doctors around the world who were using the concepts that I was talking about here, about where autoimmune diseases come from. And I asked them all to bring in two or three patients who had um, followed their recommendations and reverse their MS, reverse their lupus, reverse their rheumatoid, reverse their major depressive disorder. And you hear these patients 
and you see them crying for how sick they were. And finally, they found Dr. So-and-so who was using this new science about the environment. And, and you see that and you see it again and again and again. It reinforces for you the value of not just putting your toe in the water to this whole concept, but diving in with the life jacket, but diving in to this whole concept of the five pillars of where chronic inflammatory diseases come from. And we put all of this together, 85 interviews, and it's betrayal, the autoimmune disease solution they're not telling you. So if you go to the dr.com forward slash betrayal, it's right there. It's all free for you. Wow. Watch the whole thing. Um, it's jaw dropping. Uh, and we've had over, it's almost 700,000 people now wow. have watched this. And it's free. I, I it's mean, free. That's amazing. It's free. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I'm, I'm going to watch every single one of those interviews. Um, thank you so much for your time and your energy and your amazing, you, you're one of the best, uh, Dr. Tom at articulating what you want to get across, right? Taking some of the research that could go over the head of so many people and slowing it down, using analogies, using stories and saying it in a way that helps it land. You, you're one of the best at that. So thank you so much for your work. Um, I look forward to doing another conversation with you. I'm sure Dr. Pompo is going to bring you back into our group and do more trainings, but thank you so much. I appreciate you. And I enjoyed the conversation very much today. Thank you very much. Real pleasure to be with you.